Hey everyone, my name is Patrick and thank you for joining us on Create Post Repeat, a podcast all about the content creation journey. I am so excited because today I get to have a conversation with someone that I watched grow up to be a star. We're speaking with Wesley Taylor. Now, Wesley Taylor is someone who has been on Broadway in several shows. He has been in feature films. He's been in television. He has been in web series. He has been a writer. He's been a producer. He has created feature films. He has directed. He has done all sorts of things. And... One of the most interesting things about Wesley's life is that I grew up going to the same small private school that he did. As a matter of fact, his sister was my girlfriend in sixth grade. That's right. I've had a girlfriend before and you never even believed it. It's true. Anyway, I get to have this conversation with Wesley today where we talk all about his creative process and his journey through these different creative expressions. So without further ado, I cannot wait for you to listen to my conversation with Wesley, but don't forget to subscribe and follow me on Instagram at at Patrick Murphy. And let me know down in the comments below if you have any suggestions for who I should interview next. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Welcome everyone, we are so glad you're here. I am getting the opportunity to hang out with an old, old friend, not in age, but in years, whatever. Wesley Taylor is here with us on the podcast. How are you, man? Thanks for having me, this is a treat. Is it really, do you you know that it's a treat yet or are you hoping it is? Um, I'm hoping it is, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Who knows, who knows? (laughs) Well, one of my, I mean, we'll see. One of my favorite things about doing the podcast game and creating on YouTube, which is something that's that I'm really passionate about, is I get to meet a ton of new people. But one thing that I've been really enjoying is connecting with friends I've had for a really long time or people that I've known for a really long time that have quite an interesting creative journey. And I consider you to be one of those people. And it's been fun to move to New York and then realize, oh, you've been here as well in New York. You've been writing, you've been directing. I know you've been in LA. Now you're in North Carolina, you're alma mater. I don't want to describe what you do because I feel like your career is pretty vast. Yeah. Would you just take as long as you want and like, how would you describe what you do, what you've done, your career? Can you just kind of like talk about where you're at now and how you got there a little bit? Sure, sure. Well, uh, I am an actor, I am a writer, I'm a director, sometimes producer, sometimes teacher. Um, and I really enjoy doing all of those things. Uh, you know, I, I think I was bit with the bug early, early, early on as a kid. Um, I was sort of drunk with the sound of people laughing at my jokes or, or something that I had said, or, or, um, just being in front of people on stage was a, uh, was a sense of, I was home. (laughs) Uh, I felt more like myself in front of a group of people that I did anywhere else. Um, and so I just kept following that instinct and doing a lot of theater, um, being really jealous of every boy my age who was in a movie, uh, desperately trying to convince my parents to move us to Hollywood. Um, thankfully, them not allowing that to happen so that I wouldn't die early or get hooked on drugs. Um, that's what they would say. Um, yes. as I was growing up was, was, we're looking out for you. Uh, and, uh, I, I was really a song and dance man and, and a performer. And then in high school, I was like, Oh, I want to be an actor. I want to be good at this. And so then I went to drama school to be really good at acting. And it wasn't just, you know, of course I dreamed of being on Broadway. That was a big thing for me growing up doing musicals and going to New York city and seeing shows. But then in high school and college, I was like, I want to be in television. I want to be in film. I want to do it all. And then I also had this writing bug of, you know, at that time, I didn't take myself seriously. I didn't think of myself as a writer, but I would write sketch comedy uh, as a way of just to get to do more things as an actor and as a comedian and stuff and and collaborate with my friends. And uh, 
I think through time I realized I had a <clears throat> somewhat of a knack for a narrative and and for for storytelling and I wanted to pursue that more. Um, you know, I was very lucky in my early 20s for my dream of living in New York City and being on Broadway and all that to come true. So then you have to quickly make new dreams. Um and uh or else you know that's depressing it's like you've achieved the thing what what now death so <laughs> so you create new dreams and um and those became more creative dreams um and so in the last 15 years it's really been like more of the direction of writing and directing and cultivating and um and finding a writing partner uh seven years ago that really uh has become an accountability partner for me and yeah. someone who forces me every day. You know, we get on Zoom and we write every day. Um, and so that, that's been a, it's been a journey, but yeah, I, 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 I won't sort of stick to one thing. I got to do it all. Um, and that's, that's me. What people don't know is that you and I went to the same school growing up. Yeah. Very, uh, not a large community. We know a lot of the same people from those years. Yeah. And I love that you are sticking with the term in your professional career, accountability partner. Sure. Um, and I mean, I just, I just love that that's something that's still uh, like, um, I, I am still, I, I'm a creator. I'm doing this podcast, but full time, I'm a worship pastor at a church. That's yeah. why I moved to New York city. So the term accountability partner, it's still been around for me, but I don't hear it as often as I did when I was a 13 year old telling, telling me when being told to, um, you know, ignore every feeling I have ever. And then the word accountability partner came up anyway. That's a whole other podcast that we can get into later, but <laughs> Look, accountability <laughs> partner can be, uh, can exist in many different realms. So while he, as, as the original origin, I guess for both of us is probably, um, spiritual, religious, uh, faith-based whatnot. I mean, there are, you know, sponsors and AA are essentially right. accountability partners. Um, and creative collaborations are accountability when it comes to, you know, I feel like with 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 writing the the cliche is like you get hit with the bug and you write all night you know you're inspired and you're you're you know and that's not sustainable for a writing career that's not sustainable yeah. for producing lots of content and you, you know sticking with it you have to sort of treat it like a real job like an not everyone is the same but alex and i it's a nine to five sort of not nine to five but it's like a daily you know, situation that you show up for work. You that's know? interesting. You know, that's really interesting. I had a friend who was a, like a head hunter for, um, just corporate America, whatever. And he could work whenever he wanted, set his own schedule, but he would always be very regimented about how he spent his time. Yeah. And I got really frustrated with him once. And I said, you have such an open schedule. Why is it so hard to get time with you? And his response was, if I don't take my job seriously, no one will. Yeah. And it sounds that it feels like you're saying something similar, like this has to be treated like a real job because, and tell me if I'm wrong, but because the rest of the world views it as glitz and glamour. That's right. Yeah. That's it, we really... Have to, we have to put respect on it. I mean, we take breaks and we make sure that we value, you know, rest and mental health and all of that. But we are, the two of us are really hard workers. Yeah, um, we're both sick in the head. Is really what the what the truth is, and we can't stop um, working. Um, but it's good because we push each other. So, and this uh, was your first. I'm forgetting the name of your writing partner, Alex Wise. Alex, it was Indoor Boys your first project together. Yes, we both sort of found ourselves in Los Angeles. I had sold a script, um, a short digital pilot um and they were trying to they, they, we shot a pilot we were shopping around it never really um saw the light of day which is the case for most uh creative projects but <clears throat> i had found myself in la sort of developing this this project and alex was out there shooting a uh, soap opera actually 
and the two of us uh <laughs> started hanging out just because uh we were from the same theater circles in new york and there's not many of, of those in la and so we were just hanging out and then we started writing together we started um doing some sketches together and realized that we wanted to keep the narrative going and and suddenly there was three seasons of a web series and we had sort of found a voice together um as as collaborators and um and then obviously we we were ambitious and wanted to move on from from digital short form content to longer form and uh, feature length stuff so here we are which speaking of feature length you I just saw uh, recently, maybe recently is the wrong word, but you have now uh, created your first feature film. Yes. Yeah. So our first feature film, Summoning Sylvia, we shot it in 2021 and it was released a few months ago. We had a week long theatrical release, but now it's available everywhere on demand. Uh, Apple TV, iTunes, um, uh, Amazon Prime, Google Play, Comcast, Spectrum, everywhere where you rent or download, uh, you can you can find it. And uh, in in the fall, in October, there will be a streaming premiere on a platform to be announced very, very soon. Um, you heard it here good, first. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I can't say which one yet, but it's a good one. And uh, and so, <laughs> so, yeah. Well, that's amazing. So I kind of want to rewind a little bit because, by the way, mm -hmm. um, I was, I do my homework. So I was watching another interview of yours where you mentioned okay. this new film. Uh -huh. And I went, I didn't know you were part of that. I've seen that advertised. I've seen like a trailer here or there. And I was like, well, now I've got to go watch it. That's so exciting. You are, I would say a young man. And you're 36. kind of, you know. Depends on what you think young is. I love it. I love it. And you mentioned earlier that you had reached, um, to say it plainly, like Broadway success in your 20s. Yeah. So you kind of said the dream was accomplished. Now what? Just die? Like it like is it all over now? Or yeah. can you talk about that journey from kind of reaching that success and then going or I don't I don't want to put words in your mouth. What was next for you? Were you thinking creatively and inspirationally and even just career wise, were you thinking I don't know what to do next. Or were you always in your mind thinking, this is the next thing, or this is what I want to accomplish next, or that looks great, or was it all kind of flying by the seat of your pants? Can you just kind of go through that a little bit? Sure. Well, I mean, the life of an artist is uh, one of complete inconsistency, and there's nothing that's constant about it. And that's that's the that's the plus and the minus. You know, it's the it's the dream to live a life where you're not in a cubicle and you're not doing a sort of monotonous career and you have spontaneity and newness and new projects and you know what's tomorrow going to bring you know that's very exciting and exhilarating at times but also it's the worst thing in the world because there is no there is no consistency there is nothing to rely on ever and so the job of the artist is to never be complacent and never um sit back uh when you're in a cushy job and be like oh great now i'm now i'm set because that's not a real thing and um and also that's financially too you know you can't rest on <laughs> a great new paycheck because everything will end in our career um so yeah there is this voice in the back of you know this, this little voice in your ear always sort of making noise saying what's next what's next keeping an eye on the horizon and the fact that this will end this current thing that you're in um and so that i think will always be there for the artist it's also like what gets us out of bed in the morning that sort of anxious drive that um sick ambition <laughs> Uh, but it fuels me and it, and it keeps me going and keeps me wanting more, a blessing and a curse. Um, yeah, that's interesting. That's really interesting. I think you, I think you summed it up really well there. And, you know, I mean, I guess I have to ask, and you've probably been asked this before, but since you are doing all of these things, producing, writing, uh, feature TV show, web series, Broadway, yeah. is there something you lean to as a favorite or is it just always whatever's next? 
Well, it's funny that you say that because when you're in the thing, you want the other things, right? Isn't that like just human nature? So yes. if I'm on the TV set for a long enough time, if I'm lucky enough for it to be beyond a guest star and it's a recur or I'm, I'm there for a while, then I'm thinking about being on Broadway. And when I'm in a long running Broadway show, I'm like, oh God, it's been so long since I've been on set. And so you just sort of want, you know, the grass is always greener. Um, but, you know, there is nothing comparable to that live experience. Um, right. And yet I am obsessed with being on set. I love all of the elements working in collaboration with each other to find the the final thing. And because I also am behind the scenes and I, I you know, create my own content and I'm editing and I'm writing and I'm, you know, I'm very fascinated with all of the the various people that have to work in collaboration. But that's the same for theater as well. It's just different. It's a very different beast. And I really do love it all. I mean, there are some things that are harder for me and some things that come more natural to me, but I would never want to stop doing any of these mediums. I would assume that humor comes really naturally to you. It does. You know, given your upbringing that, that you described um and you've even like on instagram and stuff posted videos of like you as a kid just kind of like yes. owning the room yes. um do you as a creative and an artist in those collaborative spaces ever feel the natural feelings that every well a lot of humans feel where you're kind of going am i too much is this right? They're asking me for more. I don't know. Like, do you ever feel those feelings like where emotions come into play and you're kind of like second guessing yourself because so much of the content relies on you doing what you do? Oh, absolutely. Are you asking me if I ever second guess myself as an artist every day, every day of my life? Um, and, and imposter syndrome is a very real thing. Feeling like a fraud is like every other day. So, I don't know many artists who don't feel these things. And if they mm -hmm. don't admit it, you know, they're still feeling those things. They're just not saying it with their full chest like I am right now. But we, but I feel like we all deal with those things. Um, yeah. yeah, I feel like if you're not self-doubting, then then I don't know if the work is, is even good. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, interrogating yourself and your work and like having such high standards for yourself is I think also the secret right I don't know that okay so that's like the quote <laughs> that's you know so I am a I'm just now comfortable in my own skin saying I'm a content creator mm. and what's funny about this role is I do an interview like this and I'm present and I'm listening and I've got a plan, but I, I'm, I'm willing to veer off that plan, but I'm also looking for the snippet. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah, and absolutely. that was it. That's one of well, three that's, you've already given. That's part of your producer brain. Sure. Your part of your producer brain is thinking how you can sell this or how you can make this uh, more, um, I don't know, seductive. And you know, I, I find that sometimes when, you know, Alex and I are working on something and we're even on set shooting or something. We're like, oh, that's going in the trailer, you know? And it's like, that's the producer hat seeing like, what's this out of context that's going to thrill an audience. You know, the producer hat is also thinking of the, the exciting fancy face to put in your cast because you know, that'll excite people. Um, you know, we, Alex and I think like producers too. And I think that is a benefit even at times that it can be a deterrent, you know, to think of commerce over art, but sometimes it's really necessary to think about, you know, driving traffic to your content so that it's even, you know, viewed in the first place. You have, you need eyeballs. So, you know, the, the ways in which you can get people to the content so that the, they can enjoy the final thing. That's really interesting. Yeah. It seems as if you walk this line between or not what not to say it's one or the other but like being how do you let me ask this let me frame yeah. it as a question 
how are you, Wesley, or you creator, you artist, in your opinion, how are you fully yourself while also being a good collaborator? Mm. Well, I had a collaborator in my twenties, um, that was sort of training wheels, like through some digital content that I was doing and we worked well together, but it wasn't quite the right fit. And with, when I found Alex, what I realized with Alex was it is a marriage. It is a, it is just like a, a partnership or relationship. It, it takes constant communication. Like, and the, the, the secret behind any thriving relationship is communication. And we have to constantly check in and take care of each other's feelings and neuroses and ego. And, and that's part of it, you know, because we are 50, 50 of this and we have, I think, um, kind of magically found this mutual voice where we can kind of finish each other's sentences and punchlines and, and share a screen on zoom and like fail in front of each other and know that the other person isn't going to abandon the other like knowing that he's not going to jump ship when i write my worst joke in front of his face knowing that he trusts me that i'm better than my worst joke and same with him you know but that's a real trust that's earned and we've we fight a lot but you have to and you have to learn how to how to healthily fight you know and i don't mean fight like <laughs> you know like healthy productive fighting actually debate within our work yeah. sessions and of course it gets personal because we care we care deeply about the the material and, and the worlds we create and the characters we're writing and 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 so we 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 care so passionately and 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 we we have to fight it out sometimes and without fights i don't think the work would be as deep or good or funny um so it's just a constant thing where we have to continually check in, continually check in with each other and, and communicate healthily. I've had the opportunity along with you to interview a couple of different professional actors and creators. And I am taken aback by, as a viewer, I am a, I love content. Yeah. You know, those families that are like, we don't watch very much TV. I'm like, why? It's yeah. amazing. Like, what is yeah. the deal? Like, what are you, you're, you are missing out. That's Same. fine, but you're missing out. So yeah. as a consumer of content, there is this view looking at the screen that's easy to fall into of just like, oh, well, that was interesting. That just must be their personality. But what I found in these conversations is how much work goes into being able to create those moments. So whether you're talking about writing, acting, Broadway, television, feature film, uh, directing, producing, whatever it is, it's so interesting to me how that isn't just, yes, there is natural talent, but it is also something that you and others, I'm assuming, have had to, it truly is a craft and I'll admit that there are moments where I live in New York City. You throw a rock and hit an actor. And the amount of actors versus I'm a working full-time actor. I mean, it's it's a pretty, uh, it can be quite, there can be quite a disparity there. But I, I will admit that I've looked at friends who are like, I'm taking another class. And I've thought to myself like, man, how many classes do you need to take to do this thing? And then I have a conversation with someone like you and it becomes glaringly obvious how deep the work goes in your field of study to be able to step onto set, stage, behind a camera, in front of a camera and create what you create. I just, there's no question there. I'm just kind of... I'm really in awe of that work. It's very, well, very, it's, it's, it's just impressive and interesting to me, especially when you talk about then bringing someone else in and collaborating yeah. with them. That's incredible. Well, thank you. I appreciate you acknowledging that. I mean, it is a lot of work and it doesn't always get acknowledged. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
I get that, man. But, yeah. But, um, you know, there's, yeah. there's no alternative to us. And I completely understand what you're saying in a different context. Like, so I am in the church world, but I, I'm so, and I know there's, there's like, um, when you say, when anyone says the church world, there's a lot of drama that can get brought up with that in my own yeah. life as well. I get it. One thing that I've been very thankful for is that I am in that artistic space, even though it is the church world, it is artistic space. So a lot of what I do is content creation. A lot of what I do is music. And to be honest, like I'm a good musician. Yeah. I've worked really hard at it. And I've also been able to work alongside really good musicians. And I know what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. I, I've, I've expressed kind of what you said about doing different things and wondering what the next thing is and what's going to be better. And this, you know, the grass is always greener kind of a feeling. Yeah. I constantly battle with that as well. And I, I, I describe it as this, like I, if I was going to go to a restaurant, I wish I could go to all the restaurants at the same time sure, where sure, sure. on my plate is this thing, this thing, this thing, all my favorites. And I, I, I just yeah. say, I wish I could create, I know it's possible. I wish I could create this life where Monday, I'm recording a podcast with Wesley. Yeah. Tuesday, I'm leading worship with right. friends, family, new people I've never met before. Wednesday, I'm creating a new YouTube video about a new camera I love. You know what I'm saying? Like right. dipping into those different things. So I know it's a different world and I know it's a different space and we're two different people, but I fully under, I, I fully understand that. So yeah. I guess my question is, if you're constantly in this place of like, what's next? What are some things that you haven't done yet, either in or outside of your space that you're like, you know what, I I've always wanted to do well, that That's a really thing. good question. Um, you know, yeah, that's a really good question. We we wrote something that's going to be hopefully produced next year on stage. Um, and that's like, that's already assembling its creative team and it's, you know, we're, we're making those preliminary steps for that. And that's a very exciting venture for me. But I haven't actually been produced as a production on stage yet, and that will happen. But also directing a production, like directing theater instead of uh, our our you know films or um, digital content, uh, and that's also something that will probably happen in the next year because we're in talks to direct something off Broadway, um, and so there are things that are in the works that are new dreams for me that I want to do. And they haven't found the venues yet. They haven't found their timelines yet, but the creative teams have been assembled for both projects. And I am excited about those things because I have not done those things yet. And of course they also scare me because I have not done those yeah. things yet. You know, um, I, I am excited about things that I am scared of and gravitating towards those things. Um, I have, done several recurring roles on television now as an actor and like a, a bunch of guest stars but I have never like lived on a show like for six seasons and I and, and I I'm nervous about getting getting cast on the wrong one on the one that doesn't yeah. fulfill me for six years <laughs> but I also dream about getting cast in in a prestige drama a la succession or something that I, you know, I, I devour that stuff and I dream of living in those worlds. But I, of course, I imagine like you get cast in that hit show that runs for six or seven years or something. And then, and then you're like on the show and you're like, ah, I just wish I was free to be able to do these other things. You know, like it, again, grass is always greener, but if you're doing a series regular on a hit show you have a hiatus where you could do a broadway play or you could direct a movie or you could do something yeah so that's the dream for me is like being able to do everything like you just described for yourself wow. having each day being a different thing that you love and uh i will say again after you've done a certain thing for a while you dream of doing the next thing that's different and so being on set this last job only murders in the building was like so fulfilling for me because it had been a while that I had since I had been on someone else's set you know I've been on my own sets you know 
and my own projects, but being on someone else's project where suddenly my my responsibility is only my myself, me, myself, and I, and hitting my mark and telling the truth and knowing my lines and connecting with my scene partner, then that was it. And and that was so liberating and freeing and and so enjoyable because you know, I had I hadn't done that in a in a hot minute. Yeah, there's a difference. I mean, look, let's just like, you know, say it uh, bluntly for the person who's not on sets. Yeah. You're an actor who has worked with Steve Martin and Martin Short. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, wow. Yeah, yeah. But then there is a whole nother, and you don't want to screw that up. No. It, it, but then there's a whole nother, this is my thing, and I don't want to screw it up. Right. That's, that's right. really, that's a, that's... Those are two very, uh, those, those two things are very tense, but they're two very different tensions. That's, that's, that's incredible. Those are, those are probably some hard, what, and this is a very cheesy question. So forgive me, but being, but living in those types of tensions, has there ever been a moment where you've just been incredibly embarrassed? I mean, I'm yes. sure there has, but like, tell me, to, do me a favor, if you don't mind, can you tell me a story where you have been in that moment where you're surrounded by the greats or whatever, or you've created something great and you're just like, oh man, I really messed yes. that up. Constantly. <laughs> I mean, like, that's the thing about working with greats. And I have randomly been blessed by working with a lot of them since sure. I was young. Or, or yeah. you've worked very hard. <laughs> I and mean, and not, and yes, some goals. yes, no, it wasn't random and it wasn't luck. And thank you for acknowledging that. Yeah. But there is still a little bit, bit of luck. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, you know, luck is, you know, talent and timing, you know, coming together. Um, but stop. Luck <laughs> is talent and timing coming together. I'm sure there's a more eloquent way of saying that. I like it. That's the okay. t shirt. <laughs> all right. But, uh, you know, I just, I was at the right place at the right time and I had also yeah. done all my work, you know, so yeah. it, so, but, but Nathan and Nathan Lane and BB Newworth and, you know, at 21, 22 years old and, and, and then, you know, Smash, Angelica Houston and Deborah Messing and, you know, and, and last, you know, this year with Meryl Streep and Steve and Marty. And it's like, I sometimes, it's a it's an exhilarating thing to be among these people that you've idolized and it's also terrifying because you desperately don't want to say the wrong thing or to to you want them to love you of course and just one clumsy young stupid thing out of my mouth could could ruin it for me you know yeah but then you like you know spend more time with them and you realize that again you are more than your worst joke but I will say that that uh, there have been plenty of times where I've tried not to be a fly on the wall or wallpaper, and I've tried to insert myself into a, you know, you know, into a bit or a, you know, and sometimes that works, and sometimes it fails. I love and the I've, term inserting myself into a bit. <laughs> well, let me tell you, with Stephen Mark, Martin Shore, there's a lot of bits. There's a lot of gags. Yes. There's a lot of like running jokes and, uh, you know, <laughs> sometimes you jump in onto the train and you, you bomb. And then well, other let, times, yeah. Let me ask you this. So, uh, being a writer, being a creator, you understand how yeah. the script process works. I don't, but like you understand how the production aspect works, things like that. Right. Some actors will walk into, um, and this is based on conversations I've had Yeah, again, yeah. I know of some actors that walk into a space and they're like, this is my blocking. This is my line. This is my oh, mark. Yes. This is what I'm doing. And there are some actors that even depending on the project, the very same actor might walk into a different project and say, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I kind of want to be fluid with it because I want it to be live. I want it to yeah. feel like a living thing. Yeah. Where, when it comes to some of the on-screen work you've done, are there projects where you felt like, I want to know it, but I want it to feel alive. And then have, are there other projects where you're like, no, 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 I need to hit my mark. This is a different project for me. That's a great question. It's a, it's a very delicate balance because you want to be prepared and you want to have done your homework and 
know what you're doing and have, you know, choices made in your head to an extent, but then you also need to be able to play in the, in the space and react off of something that someone gives you that you did not plan for, you know? So if you've made all of your choices before you get there and you're like set in them, then you're, you, you can't, you can't be uh, affected. And that's not, that's not good. Um, it's like teaching my kids right now in summer school. I'm, you know, we're doing these <laughs> 32 bar cuts of songs and they, and they practice it so much in their bedrooms and they just like drill, 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 drill. And then by the time they bring it into class, it's like, it feels like choreography. It feels sterile. It feels like I go here and I touch my face on this word. And it's like, I don't believe you. I, I, I don't believe you at all. I need you to be a living, breathing person in the moment whose thoughts are coming to them as they're coming. You, this is the first time you've ever sang this song, ever. That's what I need to think. So it's the same thing on set. You have to really know your know your stuff, and then also you're you're, you're allowed to say. Sh <laughs> I wasn't sure. <laughs> I wasn't sure, Mister Pastor, Mister Music okay, Pastor. It's okay. No, um, and I think that. You know that, but but with only murders, you know you have also like these comedians and and this world of improv. But I will say that, you know, a lot of times you are doing it the same because of continuity, because of, you know, the script soupies, the script soupy, script supervisors. Like, uh, uh, you know, your hand was over here on that line, and we need that to match and the thing. So that that can feel limiting. But then we would do freedom takes, is what they call them on set, where anything goes and you can do whatever you want. And also, usually on set, I found, especially with comedy, that they keep rolling past the scene's natural ending so that they can find things that, that weren't in the script, you know, that, that might be ad-libbed or, or improvised. Um, and I know as a, a creator myself, like, I steal a lot even before action. I, I steal behavior when I'm editing and stuff that, that is just so authentic. It, you know, the actor didn't even know. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's cool. I remember I interviewed, I told you I interviewed uh, Griffin Matthews recently where yeah. I watched him in The Flight Attendant mm -hmm. and I had no idea he was in it. I texted him in the middle of a scene and said, I had no idea you were in this. And it became a thing where he allowed me to, while I was watching the show, send him questions. Here I am watching a television show. My friend that I used to sing with is on screen and I'm like, this is interesting. He said, that was totally ad-libbed. I'm like, wow, so cool. Yeah, yeah. And I had a moment where you were in SpongeBob. I sent you a text message where I was just like, and this is more of a thank you than anything where I was like, I'm coming to see you in SpongeBob tonight. And just yeah. like any other person in any other job, you responded, you were like, actually, I'm about to call in sick. Um, do you still want me to, to come in and do the role so you can see it? And I was like, please stay home. It's no problem. I'm a 40 year old man. I'll be, I'll be going to SpongeBob. I'll be fine. So I've kind of had this like interesting access to people in in these types of places where i've watched well, people i grow up with like i said be in very visible roles it's been it's been just really really interesting and now to actually hear you describe those roles to me it's just again the the work that goes into what we as the consumer just get to experience is pretty it's it's far more grand than I would ever imagine. It's yeah, it's it's just it's beyond interesting. I just wanted to just quick side note, but well, thank I, you. Maybe a maybe a very difficult question, maybe a hard question, but like I did want to ask you about the stage because you know you have had the opportunity to be in several Broadway shows. I don't want you to get in trouble, but what what was your favorite role to play on Broadway? Second question, what are some of your favorite Broadway shows? They Whoa. don't have to be the ones you were in. Yeah. Okay. So my Broadway debut in Rock of Ages was such a stupid, lucky thing because it was, you know, I got this 11 o'clock number that like, I, I don't know, it was just such a gift, that show. And it was the gift that kept giving. I mean, because we, we it was an off-Broadway show that you know, I didn't think was going to amount too much. Not that I didn't believe in the material, but I just didn't think New York would embrace this very lowbrow 
jukebox thing. And they embraced it so much. Like it transferred to Broadway. It got great reviews. We ran for six years. I mean, that's a show that ran on Broadway for six years. And so it was, it was, I think a, such a surprising experience in my life that kept surprising me. Um, but the time between Adam's family and SpongeBob was a long enough period for me to really appreciate Broadway and being on the boards and, and having that life. So when I came back to Broadway at 30 years old in SpongeBob after time away and living in LA and, and whatnot, SpongeBob, I appreciated so much more than my first two Broadway shows. Um, I appreciated the experience so much more. I, I, I was able to sit more in the moment of SpongeBob and, and, and appreciate the, the process of it and the rehearsal period and the, just everything about it. I wasn't, I mean, I'm sure I still was thinking towards the future, but I wasn't as much as I was in my early twenties. Um, so I'd say the, the most pure process, the most enjoyable was probably SpongeBob. It was an infectious, joyous experience. Interesting. Which yeah. I don't think I don't think anybody would guess that that would be your answer. Really? In all fairness, because you just think SpongeBob and you think um, commercial touristy commercial. I was even going to say kids show, but sure, sure. It brings me to I'm I'm recalling a memory because I watched you give an interview about SpongeBob, where. I don't know if you, you'll you remember this because I know you've done this a lot, but you had a lot to say about the depth of that show. Yeah. And what was really, what was really being shared. Yeah. Well, I, I wrote it off, at, you know, at the beginning as a kid show, as a tourist trap, like as everyone would. Um, but I hadn't read it yet. The show is highly political and it's, it's not subtle with this messaging, actually. It's, right. It's quite, you know. And I was, I, I got to play someone who, you know, was anti-science and anti-inclusion uh, and, and uh, was sort of telling the, it was sort of xenophobic. It was sort of, uh, you know, anti-immigration. It was sort of, you know, I was, I was yeah. basically a, a conservative Republican as Plankton, the, the, the little copod. So um, that was therapeutic for me too. Um, you know, the, the. 2016 election was really hard on me and my family and it broke us all apart and um we had to really you know work to mend those wounds and um i needed to to do some work um in on healing myself and and spongebob felt really healing um and impactful for me i completely understand obviously not everyone has their own story and i would never want to say like I'm in your story. I get it. Right, but I do, right. but I do understand. Yeah. Um, I think that, yeah, 2016 was a hard, here I am a, um, uh, 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 a cis white male saying 2016 was really tough. <laughs> um, I understand the irony. Um, yeah. it's not lost on me, but I am, but I am understanding, uh, uh, but I am saying that, yeah, it was, that was a hard place to be. Yeah. Um, and that's me saying that. So I understand someone, anyone that is in, that is not in the majority culture. It was obviously harder. And I'm really sorry because I watched, I had many tough family conversations and, um, especially being in the spaces that I walk in. Um, I can imagine. Uh, I, I also learned a lot about myself and things that I didn't like that I yes. had to, work on. I had some, definitely had some, uh, I'll, I remember my wife is an educator in the DOE. Um, she's done really well. She's an amazing, amazing educator. And so she will come home with words and phrases and skills and tools that I've never heard of before. And when I remember our first conversation about implicit bias and I said, Oh, I have those. Let That's me work on those. Anyway, mm -hmm. it was an interesting time. I think we all learned a lot. I'm sorry that it was tough for you. I, I, I know, I'm sure it was, and, and that stinks. Yes. Um, I will say 
that one of my favorite things about the interview I saw you give about SpongeBob is you ended the, uh, you, you kind now of- Now I'm end, so nervous. You ended the interview by looking right at the interviewer because you had shared some of your perspective about the show, how, it, it, how as you just mentioned, much deeper than yeah. you know, what people view it as. And that interviewer kind of scoffed a bit. <laughs> sure. I think I and know which you, one you're talking about. And you went, have you seen the show? <laughs> and they said, well, and you said, have you seen the show? <laughs> and I think you, you've kind of ended the interview with like, maybe you should watch it. And I was just like, I was just like, man, good for you, man. Like, good yeah. for you. Like, well, that, I, I, I loved that. I think it was also during a time... It was probably award season. In fact, I, it was because I remember the interview you're talking about. Okay, okay. And 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 you know, there's all these voters for award season Tonys and all the stuff, and and they they have to come see everything, but they don't, right? And you know which ones they're going to avoid. Like it, it's just, you know, we judge so many books by their cover. Like that, yeah. it is human nature and yeah. i understand the 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 desire to write off something like spongebob as like what's happening to broadway <laughs> but but you know my first show out of drama school you know my fourth year of drama school i'm doing as you like it i'm doing henry four i'm doing you know and i get out of school and i do my first job out the gate is this trashy bubblegum 80s jukebox musical with white snake songs and poop jokes. And I'm like, this is not high art. My, I'm embarrassed <laughs> for my teachers to come see this or whatever. And then my teachers come see it and they're like, what are you talking about? This is comedy technique. This is what we, this is what we trained you to do. Like, it's like you're, a, like you're apologizing when you don't need to. Exactly. And I think that, but, but my instinct that Rock of Ages was less than was, I think the general instinct of a theater going audience so of, of the theater of the, the cliche theater demographic, um, which is to poo poo on jukebox to poo poo on anything that's like seen as commercial or a people's show. But let me tell you, Shakespeare was a people's playwright. <laughs> like uh, uh, the peasants went to Shakespeare and they said, you know, wow. so, so I think it's a little warped our, our, and and when you look at the landscape of TV and film, there's something for everyone. There's succession and there's the Big Bang Theory. You know, you can't, yeah. it, it's, you know, so you can't expect all of Broadway to be Leopoldstadt and, and, you know, these serious high dramas. You know, you need something for everyone. And there is value and artistic merit in all of those things. I, I mean, I just you can't like, tell me that, that Big Bang Theory's actors aren't delivering high, uh, that's a genre comedy, but Jim Parsons is still a trained clown who is serving like at the top of his game. And so, sorry, I, I'm rambling, but no, um, you're not, you're not all this to say that I, I feel very passionately now about what people want to turn their nose up to, um, because mm -hmm. most of the time those people haven't seen the thing that they're trashing. Do your homework people. I love, um, you've mentioned Succession, and just total side note, you mentioned Succession several times. Amazing show. Just, yeah. did you've seen the end? Yes. Oh, gosh. That anyway, right. it, it was, oof, it was amazing. Um, well, I know we're kind of like coming up on time here, but I did want, there's one thing I did want to uh, talk to you about. Okay. And I, and I did not send this ahead of time. This is the surprise question, comment, what have you. Okay. Um, I mean, actually, I'm just now. So I've been. I've not only been like you know someone that's like like been in been in like we were in our early stages of life together at the same school, yeah. four years apart, whatever. I was in the uh, same. I'm the same age as your sister. I've always known her as Nikki. Do you call her Nikki or Nicole? Nicole. Okay. So growing I've always up, called her Nicole since I was a kid. Yeah. Growing up, everybody called me Pat. And mm -hmm. now if I connect with anybody later on in life, they're like, Hey, Pat drives me crazy. I want to be yeah. Patrick. Now people are allowed to change anyway. Yeah. Um, Nicole, I mean, she was like, we, we were steady in sixth grade <laughs> and I need you to know that one day there was a little bit of drama in our sixth grade class. Sure. 
I received a note in my locker. And all I remember, it was a long note. Um, I, th- I was kind of like a, hey, we got to get this right or we're going to have to break up. From Nicole. All I remember is the one line, it was so dramatic, where she wrote, I'm losing friends, Patrick. And I, I don't know why I remember that, but it was like this thing that hit me so hard. Like, you got to get this stuff right because I'm losing friends. <laughs> That's my sixth grade drama with your sister. Savage, savage. But, and by the we have we have mended that fence. We are now, you know, we're friends. Oh, good. But I also need you to know that you and I and Selena Gomez have something in common. It is Barney the Purple Dinosaur. Oh, sure, sure. That's right. And I and I all and I just need you to know this. Um, the reason why I I am a musician, vocalist, what have you is because I was in your mom's second grade music class. Oh, God. And the school slash church, they were putting on this, like, July 4th, Let's Go America Fest show. Sure. Where um, they were, they wanted two second graders to sing Proud to be an American. (laughs) And did you book? Did you get the part? Oh, it's better. (laughs) She said, who would like to audition for this? Several children raised their hand and she said, okay, so-and-so, Heather Heard, you're auditioning, great. And then she looked at me and she said, Patrick, you're auditioning. And then moved and I went, I went, no. And she's like, your hand wasn't raised. Well, you're auditioning. I I booked it. Yeah. Well, I booked it. Now, again, I mean, you had some dulcet tones at a young age, you know? I have, I have zero game. I've never had any game whatsoever. But once again, I was on stage with yet another huge crush of mine, Heather Hurd. Yeah, sure. Singing Proud to be an American. Crushed it. Years later, she's the one who put me in front of some sort of like, I don't even know how to describe this person, but like a singing agent of some kind that eventually had me also singing for Barney, much like you did. My God. But at some point, you continued on that path, and I just went some other way, I guess. I could have been the Broadway star, bro. (laughs) Where did I go wrong, is my question. And I could have been a music pastor, right? Sure. You could have. I I feel like... Give me all all your jobs, jobs right now. You're a podcaster, producer... Your, well, uh, does it your... have to make money to be a job? No, doesn't. Okay. Uh, husband, dad. Yeah, those are big. Those are big. Um, content creator. And yeah, I'm a, a music or worship. Pa- I'm a pastor at a church and I happen okay. to do all the music stuff. But wow. I could have been I could have been a Broadway star. What happened? And I'll tell you what happened. I'm in a recording session for, I'm, I'm talking all about me and I've asked you to come here. I'm so sorry. No, I love it. I'm in a recording session with this woman singing these Barney songs. Yeah. My voice changed way late. And all of a sudden I'm having a hard time singing yeah. uh, th- these songs. Yeah. And boom, they get on the talk back mic in the, in the, in the booth and they go, Hey, are you doing okay? I said, yeah, I'm just having a hard time singing. They go, okay, your voice is probably changing. We're going to have to get you on the adult recordings pretty soon. And yeah. I went, okay, cool. Never called me again. Yeah. That was a, that was a, a nice way to let you go. They let me go, didn't they? Let me tell you something. I also got fired <laughs> at, uh, around that age. What? How old are you when this happened? So I'm probably 12 or 13. Okay. So that's... <laughs> okay. Is, is this with Sarah Moore? Yes. Is this with... Yeah. Yeah. So we worked with the same types in Orlando. Yeah. The same people. Um, but But a few years before I was of that age... I was doing I was doing the Barney vocals. I was doing a lot of industrial or straight to VHS type stuff, recording recording booth. And then I get a I get an offer for a very cool thing. This is um, I'm like nine years old, ten years old, something like that. And it's to be the background vocals for the Land Before Time California live show. And it's like the Universal Studios. They do this big live Land Before Time thing. And I am 
cast as Littlefoot. Opposite Mandy Moore as Ducky. It was, you know, she was gigging in Orlando at that time. And and she was a crush of mine, or so I thought. She was about a foot taller than me and a couple years older than me with this like perfect blonde hair. I probably just wanted to be her, but I thought I had a crush on her. And um and I was so excited and so nervous. And there's like four of us in a recording booth and Wait, Mandy's I'll, there too? Yeah. Yeah, oh. she's she's in the same booth. And I knew Mandy before because we had done radio commercials together. We had done radio jingles. Like, you'll be saving lots of money with Bob and Buster too. It's back to school savings at Bob Dance, like that kind of shit. And so Bob uh, Dance you know, Dodge, we, where everybody rides. I remember that's it. right. We go way back. So I'm yeah. in the you know, I'm it's I'm nine years old, but I've been around the block. And uh we're recording all day and uh suddenly i get sent home and i'm confused why i'm getting released hours hours before the other kids are getting released and my mom i'm sure my mom explained to me in the car that i was being let go fired but she didn't use those words and phrases so so i didn't get the message like i knew i wouldn't be coming back but i didn't right or maybe I did get the message and I refused to process it. So the next day to like deal with those feelings, I walked into my middle school. I was probably sixth grade, fifth grade. I'm not sure. And I not only lied through my teeth and, and said I was still recording this, this thing, but that they had somehow bumped me up and now I'm like in one of the movies and I'm I'm recording the voice of Littlefoot in one of the movies of Land Before Time. Um, and this is before the internet when people are fact checking you. And so I was signing every trapper keeper in my middle school. I was the middle school celebrity and I really enjoyed my time on top. And it all came crashing down like when one girl like watched the movie the VHS and like paused it at the end during the credits and it was like voice a little she's like that wasn't you and I was like clearly you watched the wrong one like I'm in the wrong. <laughs> I'm in three and four You're, you know I just kept making it up and this white lie followed me like into high school like I think it was soft like freshman or sophomore year where I was still like oh no I'm still lying about this um so I'm here to I'm here to like set the truth on this podcast um i did not voice littlefoot in any of the movies of land before time i was fired from the live show recording i want to thank you for your honesty well you're welcome i this kind of is your dear evan hansen story this is why i came on the podcast yeah this the is, I mean, the, the one dozen people that listen to this <laughs> they they thank you they thank you for your service they're gonna be shook they're gonna be shook it's gonna it's gonna be earth shattering for um the uh industry well listen yeah. man i think i think with that i mean i don't think we can get more emotional no and i think Let's we should just wrap it up with that i i just want you to know that um i am it's i am super thankful for your story i'm super thankful for your honesty and i'm very thankful for your perspective because I think so much of what you shared totally speaks to a lot of creative people, especially when it comes to just like identity in uh, yourself, in your work. And it seems like you've really put the work in to try and create, try and push yourself also creating healthy space for yourself. And I just think that's really really admirable but um before we go like where do you want people to follow what you're doing what, where do you want people to watch what you're doing what are the projects that you want people to know coming down the pipeline or wh where do you want us to check you out ah okay so only murders comes out um i think august 8th okay uh, uh i'll be at good speed this fall doing a new musical uh called the 12 um our movie will have a streaming premiere in October to be announced soon. Um, the next movie that we're making is going to go into production probably in the winter. And uh, yeah, that's that's it for the rest of the year. Wow. Just a few things. 
<laughs> just a few things. Just, yeah. just, just, um, just a live show, a <laughs> television show, and a feature film, and then another feature film. No big yes. deal. So we're going to check all that out and <laughs> and, okay. and um, uh, rate them accordingly. Thank you so much for having a conversation with me today. It was a treat uh, chatting with you, like getting into some of like our old past and like also hearing just like about what you're doing. It's been really inspiring. Thanks for having me on, Patrick. Thanks for joining me today. Don't forget that links to everything you need can be found down in the description. And if you want to stay up to date with what I'm doing, you can always follow me on Instagram by subscribing to at Patrick Murphy. And while we're talking about subscribing, go ahead and subscribe to my YouTube channel as well. I'll see you in the next one. But don't forget, before you go, you should probably watch this video.